We hope you don't have cancer. But if you do, this show's for you. The Stupid Cancer Show! Hey guys, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Stupid Cancer Show. My name is Matthew Zachary, the founder and CEO of Stupid Cancer. I'm joined today by my BFF, Jesse Hershkowitz. How you doing, guys? A fellow young adult cancer survivor whom I met many, 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 many years ago. Indeed. He was 25, was just diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of bone. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a cancer of the blood, so congratulations on having the cancer in your yes. a blood cancer in your bones. It was how'd that uh, work out for you? Well, it was very treatable <laughs> because it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it was also very rare at the same time. Yeah, yeah. because it was a blood cancer of the. Well, bones. you were a special so, kind of guy. Yeah, I, I had that little niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. A niche market of Jesse Hirsch. <laughs> exactly, place. exactly. I had to do it originally. Yeah. So we had met literally like. Barely months after Stupid Cancer was started, originally as the I'm Too Young for This Cancer Foundation yeah. in January of 07, it was it you or your dad or, or yeah. someone reached out to me? Re re well, remind uh, me the story. So I, I um, was diagnosed uh, back in September of 06, and I started, I did eight months of chemo at uh, Sloan Kettering. And... You know, um, I worked on music throughout the treatment. Um, well, you, did, uh, we should start with like you're yeah. an artist I, out I of the a, gate. Yeah, recording artist, producer, um, independent recording studio owner, kind of DIY musician, so to speak. And I'd always kind of been on this pursuit of, you know, my passions, my dreams, et cetera. And then sure. a cancer diagnosis kind of hit right in the middle of it. So um, I wrote and recorded an album while I was going through the treatment. That really helped me kind of get out ahead of things, not dwell on the fear that I was feeling, kind of try to remain positive and fight my way through it. So as a result of that, you know, my time was occupied, my mind was occupied. Um, I didn't really deal with a lot of the the fear, the uncertainty, the, you know, um, those emotions while, while fighting the cancer. Um, the day after I was told I was, you know, in remission, Go home. I woke up in the middle of a panic attack. Everything, yeah. you know, came back. At yeah, once. like you're done. Have fun. Exactly. Get back to your life as if nothing ever exactly. happened. Exactly. And I woke up the next morning like, oh, shh. <laughs> you know, we're like, not. The FCC is not a sponsor. You say what you want. Awesome. On the show. I woke up the next morning like, oh shit. Like, yeah. What do I do now? You know. And um, the next year or so was really difficult for me. It was prob probably one of the hardest parts of the whole process. Just What's next? Back to what life. Now? What's next? Well, now that I have my life back, right. potentially, like, what do I do with it, you know? Um, and what I started off doing with it, you know, at least for the first six months, was nothing. <laughs> I would... Um, Laid on the couch. Exactly. I did would nothing. stay on the couch. I would write lyrics in my notebook. I would watch, you know, Back to the Future and Star Wars for the umpteen thousandth yeah. time. And and I would do anything I could to kind of stay in my own comfort zone. Right. Um, my mom kept trying to encourage me to find organizations, support groups, people my age who had been through it, but they just weren't out there. No. You know, I just didn't have access to it. Not the, in those days. They weren't within my reach, you know. Um, so, you know, and I wasn't really, you know, taking the the the, the incentive incentive to yeah. get out online and start Googling and find it. I was happy to just yeah. retreat to my comfort zone. So my mom did it, you know, on my behalf. And she went out online and she started Googling things like young adult cancer. and Which, by and, the way, most people don't think to Google. Yeah. They Google cancer. Right. You know, young adult cancer doesn't occur to people to type into the search. Right, exactly. For whatever reason, she might have um, not included that in her first couple of searches. You know, she might have been misdirected to either pediatrics or geriatrics. Yeah. But um, my mom's pretty persistent and yeah. thinks outside of the box. So... You know, I can, I wasn't there right next to her, but I can envision her, you know, after three or four searches that didn't quite produce the results she was looking for, like racking her brain for what additional yeah. words to, to put in. But nonetheless, um, it led her to you. It led her to a website called Steps for Living, actually, at, at the time. That's the ultimate secret of stupid cancer. Yeah. Um, and she read about your story, and then she proceeded to compose an email to you, which mm -hmm. uh, I believe verbatim said, uh, help, my son just finished chemo six months ago, and now he's afraid to get up off my couch, and he won't you know, get back out into the world, and I don't know what to do. Please help me. 
And uh, and I decided to drive to Jersey. He did consciously yeah. chose yeah. to drive to Jersey. Yeah. So he and came I met out. this young lad, literally, yes, in your bed, in a couch, you know, messed up, not yeah. knowing what to do, and yeah. we had a a truly human meeting. Yeah. yeah. With you and your family. Absolutely. Um, that was a tough time for me. You know, it's a lot of that particular time frame is still kind of not a blur but blurish you know i mean i was yeah. i was just finished treatment and and i wasn't really in the right kind of headspace and that was a big step for me getting back into that headspace to really kind of get back to life and 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 do something with it that was meaningful um my dad describes that meaning meeting and i i revert to his description of it just cuz i think it's a bit more reliable but yeah. uh we went out to a local italian restaurant in jersey and you came out and I introduced myself and I met, but I was still kind of reserved and back. And, you know, on my face, my dad says it was written just like, you know, what does this guy know about me and what I've been through? And yeah. come on, like, really? All right, I'll uh -huh. go have dinner and then, like, take me back to my couch. Yes. You know? And uh, and I kind of had that same, like, droop in the shoulders mm -hmm. and, you know, not really making eye contact until we got to the, the restaurant and sat down. And, and then you pulled out the, uh, the Steps for Living packet and kind of showed me the compilation album that you were working on and some t-shirt designs yeah. and and um you know my my dad describes my body language during that meeting as just something like yeah yeah you know and it, it was you know Piqued your interest it, absolutely and it, you know i i wasn't like all better the next day you no, know of course not. but it certainly Pointed me on a path to, to getting back to well, where I am now. So. What I found in you was a lot of what happened to me. Many of you know that I was a concert pianist, trained to go to grad school to write for film and television, and I lost the ability to play. I lost all of my inspiration. I lost my muse. I say, like, I, I, I lost everything, but I didn't. I lost my life, but I didn't die, was what I talk about. And I, too, wrote music by hand um, because I couldn't play. Yeah. And I couldn't do anything. Nothing would get me out of that, out of that bed, out of that couch. And you did something that I had done, and I saw that parallel. I went out there and I said, "Screw it! I'm going to make CDs. I'm going to write. I'm going to put my music out to the world. I'm going to write it no matter how well I play." And I produced two CDs in 90, 97, 98, whatever that was. And then you had converted this angst and this pain and channeled it into an album. It saved my life. I Absolutely can't. I was so life. profoundly impacted by hearing all those songs on Cancerous Flow, Lyrical Journey, yeah. which we can put all the links below. If you have never heard these songs, they've been littered across all of the media that Stupid Cancer has been producing for 12 years now, including and notwithstanding the official Stupid Cancer anthem, which we know you've heard because it ends out this show. You know what it is. You know what it is. And we'll put links again. Like this, There has never been a, a more powerful manifesto in art form <laughs> than the Stupid Cancer manifesto anthem Thank that you, you. you put together. It was, you know, it just kind of came to me. It was at, I think, Stupid Cancer OMG Summit. 2012 in Vegas. No, it was in New York City. 2011. Oh, you know, it was 2010. 2010. It was the 2010 one. You're right. Yeah, and I had just gotten back from a road trip to Pittsburgh like two weeks prior. I went out there to watch the Jets lose in the AFC Championship to the Steelers. And, Congratulations. Uh, yeah, thanks. Great, <laughs> great trip. Um, but the song Black and Yellow by Wiz Khalifa was just kind of blowing up at that point in time. Yep. And he's from that area. So when I was out there, it was even more on a grand scale. Like yeah. You couldn't go anywhere without hearing it. Every restaurant or, you know, bar you walked into, there's people on the black floor. Black and yellow, black and yellow. Waving their bandanas <laughs> around yeah, and just yeah. singing this song. So, I mean, it got stuck in my head. Um, and then I ended up at OMG 2010. 10, yeah. Two weeks later, sitting there, you know, listening to the opening remarks and I just started going, stupid cancer, stupid cancer, stupid yeah. cancer. And it, the whole thing honestly kind of wrote itself. Yeah. You know, it just, it, it kind of needed to, needed to, become what it was. So. I feel like we've grown up together, the organization, myself, and you, and here you are, yeah. what, uh, 12 years later? 12 years later, yep. Yeah, and you're yeah. good? Yeah, 100%. You love that question? How are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> Never ends. No, it's, you know, I mean, um, I'm feeling, in short, the, the 
the same as any other young adult my age is feeling right. these days, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm, I have stresses as they relate to work and family, and, and but they're day-to-day normal right. young adult stresses. There was a time where cancer and the what if and the unknown, it, it consumed me. You know, and I think that's a lot of what kept me on the couch in a hooded sweatshirt, you know, yeah. hanging over my eyes. And, and so just the ability to, to deal with that and, you know, I mean – Time is a great healer as well, but um, I think as much as time, community has has really helped me. You know, yeah. I've attended every OMG summit, yeah. every cancer con. I think I missed one along the years. It's, right, it's it's something I look forward to every year. Um, the camaraderie of it, the 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 information, just the the, the connections that are made, mm-hmm. and um, so it's it you know part of the reason that I'm here. I think, and that I've been able to get to a place where I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Know? Um, good. Yeah, exactly. Good. Never look under the hood. I, I once worked with a guy and I love this. He says, it's not just good. It's good enough. Good enough. But I'm the, it, that's good enough. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Um, so let's switch gears for a sec to uh, this show is going to be, uh, I want to focus on fertility. Okay. Because that is one of the strongest narratives of what makes young adult cancer, not better or worse, but very different. Yeah. So yes, out of the blue. Mm-hmm. This virile young man <laughs> gets not hot, just the foam of bone. Yeah. What was, if there were, any conversations about preserving your fertility? Um, you know, I'm glad there were those conversations. They were really done last minute and kind of shotgunned um, before I started the chemo process, but we were able to make it work. Um, it wasn't really on the forefront of my mind. It wasn't something that um, – I knew really. Um, right. It wasn't obvious to me that right. chemo makes would have sterile, done that. Yeah, yeah. Even does that. You know, it just. I was focused on how long am I going to be doing this? What are the immediate effects? And on am me? I going to die? Am I going to die? Be funny. Be honest with you. I tell people this these days just for a laugh. But um, you know, you deal when you're diagnosed, and I'll get back to fertility in just yeah, a yeah, second. Yeah, sure. I digress a bit. Um, when you're diagnosed, you deal with a lot of like, what if I never. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are really big. For me, what if I never get the record deal I'm pursuing? What if I never reach people with my music? But one of the things that I was really important to me at that moment was, what if I never get to see the end of the television show Lost and find <laughs> out what happens? Because it was like season That's three right. when yeah, I yeah. was diagnosed. You the know? phenom was just starting. And I was like, I, you know, that that's was, some real yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. That's practical stuff. Um, but so it all happened really quickly. You know, um, one day I, f- I felt fine. You know, my arm was a little bit sore. I, f- I thought maybe I'd slept on it in the wrong position. I went back to bed that night, hoping it would work itself out. And it actually broke itself mm-hmm. overnight. Yeah. Uh, the tumor was inside the bone and it, it had no more room left to grow. So it exploded basically. Yeah. Um, you know, by the time I went and got x-rayed and MRI'd, they had determined that I should have been on chemo yesterday. Right. You know, um, just because they had to get out ahead of it. There wasn't a lot of time to, you know, spend three weeks talk, working, worrying about fertility. And right. So um, so who brought it to your attention? It was my oncologist, Okay. to be honest with you. I, well, so, props to that person. Yeah, I was treated – actually, I think it was the nurse practitioner. It wasn't, well, it wasn't to that the person oncologist. Too. She was great. Um, I was treated, even though I was 25 years old, I was treated, I had a juvenile form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I was treated on the pediatric um, right. floor at Sloan Kettering. And, um, you know, the team that I had, I, I guess, had a lot of experience with 16, 17, 18-year-olds. It tends to be more know. of a known standard in the teen years, yeah. although you were a minor. I mean, well, you were with minors, right, but you right. weren't a minor. and. Yeah. You know, the last thing on the mind of a parent who has a teenage child with cancer is grandparenthood. But clearly you were a sentient young adult. Yeah. yeah. And they just brought it up. So it it all really happened very quickly. And it was a little bit embarrassing, but I had to kind of put my trust in my parents to like handle the logistics, you know, because I was still shell shocked from the diagnosis. Of course. I was, you know, if I wasn't out of the house going to an appointment or meeting with a, a Medicaid rep or doing something that directly needed to be done to facilitate my treatment, I was laying in bed. Right. Like door closed. Well, my off, mom drove know. me to the sperm bank. So I think we share awkward memories. Exactly. Exactly. So my mom is the one like my, the nurse practitioner mentioned it in a, in a morning, you know, meeting, bef- you know, maybe three or four days before I was scheduled to start chemo or maybe th- 
before I was like a throwaway comment, kind of like a throwaway comment. <laughs> and my mom on the way home, like was on the FDR on speakerphone <laughs> in the car <laughs> with me in the passenger seat, you know, burying my head in my yeah. hands, like making an appointment. And, right. then, you know, the next day I was there putting like a 1980s era VHS tape. Oh, I had those. <laughs> those are, and, the, and the old and, magazines. From and, the, yeah. Oh, so the hair, bad. like the poofy hair. Oh, God. <laughs> bad news. Bad news. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we made it happen and made it happen, I think, two or three days before um, I was scheduled to start treatment like i said it was last minute i i but it was brought up but it was brought and up and that's so critical and it did happen and i was i wanted to to maybe do it one more time before i started but right. i ran out of time mm -hmm. you know because they had actually suggested at the bank that you come <clears throat> in two or three times yeah. beforehand just so that there's more to i had like 30 minutes yeah i had <laughs> and then it bam yeah, started yeah. i had one shot you know you know i was there for whatever not a very long time yeah. and then um i was getting chemo like i was getting my port put in two yeah. days later um so but funny story is um you know i actually i think like yourself um came back to virility you yeah know, a few years later and um they told me it wasn't guaranteed to happen but you know I, I went and got myself tested i think five or six years later and found that i'm back well within the you know child rearing uh limits but i still pay my annual uh cryogenic storage fee yeah I, I did that case. for a very long time and and i'm glad i i did yeah of course that came in handy yeah so so really quickly just to wrap up then your your name your rap name yeah was herbalist herbalist yeah. talk me through where that came from uh it's okay so or is um, it self-evident urban yeah, yeah urban urban verbalist really yeah, kind yeah. of you know but i started um i was Really, really long story short, and no pun intended, but, you know, I was four foot two <laughs> all, all throughout high school. I think when I was a senior, I was like maybe four eight. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, I wasn't really noticed right. at all. Wow, um, not on the athletic field, and I wasn't like a star student, you know. So when I started battle rapping people in the cafeteria at age fifteen and and winning, um, right, you know, and Eminem style, people started slamming their fists on the cafeteria tables. And yeah. Going, oh, you know, it it was kind of an indication that I should maybe continue pursuing that. So I did, and and you know, the name was given to me in you know as a junior or senior year in high school. Um, by somebody else and um, it's stuck it's stuck yeah it's stuck you well know? you'll always I mean, be my herb <laughs> i'll take it yeah i'll take it yeah. all right jesse hershkowitz one of my dearest friends on the planet young adult survivor 12 years out thank you so much for coming on this this, this is like third you can google the art you know we'll put a link below in the description to the times that he has been on the audio version of the stupid cancer show lots of links below episode number seven that was like the summer of 07. Yeah. Wow. Yep. God. All right. <laughs> I'm like getting off a clump. Part, part of right. the nostalgia. All right. <laughs> well, this has been an extraordinary episode of the Stupid Cancer Show. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you back here next time. Jesse Hershkowitz. Yay! All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Thank you for watching our show. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you are alerted whenever we post new content. Follow us online at stupidcancer.org, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know the deal. Stupid Cancer, we make young adult cancer suck less. Bye-bye.